All right, super excited today to talk about pressed flowers in a nature journaling, how to nature journal with pressed flowers, and a few updates because um, in just a minute, we're going to look at these and figure out ways to incorporate them into our nature journal. But first, let me say hi to everybody that's joining in on the live. I see James is here, Ivea is here, Terry is here, and I think Cindy is also here. If you don't know about it, there is a live chat over there, and you can post a comment or a question. It's really fun to join in on the live. There might be an echo today because I'm in a different building. Just got back from um, the Santa Barbara area where I was teaching at a wilderness skills class. And I'm um, not going to talk too much about that. I did do a little bit of nature journaling there, which was really fun. But mainly I was teaching animal tracking. I'll tell you more about that later, but that's not what today's show is all about. Um, today's show is going to be about different ways to incorporate plants into our nature journals. Here's one that I just, this journal's just been filled up and there's a lot going on in here, but there was still enough space to add some press plants, even in some of this collage and sort of art journaling type stuff. Um, so I will be talking about this in a different episode, probably just for my Patreon members. Actually, I'll be doing the journal share of that one. And I just started a new one. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at how to, um, how to press flowers and then incorporate them into our nature journals in a variety of way. And it's going to be really fun because what we're going to do is we're going to go through my plant press here and we're going to pull things out like it's Chris opening Christmas presents. And then we'll figure out case by case what to do with those, how to incorporate them onto the nature journal page. Um, I also am staying with a friend and they said to make myself at home. So I'm sampling all of the different types of chocolate that they had in the cabinet. Um, let me know what you think. Um, about the ethics of that, um, how much, if you're staying with someone and they say, make yourself at home, how many of their chocolate bars should you sample? Um, post your answer in the comments. And then we will even press a fresh plant because I happen to find um, a fresh plant outside um, and we'll see how that part goes. So let's jump right into it and see what we have behind door number one. Oh, Mindy's here. So one of the cool things is um, about a plant press and how you can incorporate with your nature journaling is um, if you're in a situation where you're not going to be able to draw plants or have very much time to draw plants, you could press plants um, during that time and then draw a nature journal then later. And that's kind of like what I'm going to do, to do right now because I didn't really have that much time to um, nature journal and draw plants in the field. And so I pressed a bunch and I actually don't really like working off of photos on the computer, even if they're photos that I took, but how nice would it be instead to nature journal? If you're going to nature journal from a reference, why not nature journal from a pressed plant? So that's one of the things that I'm discovering is a huge benefit of pressed plants. Some of us don't really work as well from photos There's something about looking at the screen i easily end up getting distracted by something else that's on my phone um, all right so i'm going to start opening this up and seeing what we have here i'll describe my setup a little bit more later i think i took oh here we go let's start with this i haven't even i nat i wasn't i naturalisting everything either like i usually do because um it was in the back country and um, part of the whole point was not to be using phones. All right, this is a little bit big, but let's see what I can do here. And maybe we can just start with something big. So I actually have this open page in my nature journal right here. One thing I could also always do is cut part of this off and not necessarily use the whole one. There was lots of this plant growing underneath the oak trees where many people were camping. It was growing together with um, milk thistle and uh, uh, what's that stuff? Claytonia, also known as miner's lettuce. It looks like I might've imported an ant with 
my um, pressed plants. So you can see I have been trying to use um, pages in my press that are the exact same size as my nature journal so that if I do something big like this, it would actually potentially fit on a page. And it also just helps me remember um, the size of the page that I'm going to be working with when it comes to composing um, or using that pressed plant in a nature journal. It sounds like Mindy's going to be going on a trip and taking her plant press. That's awesome. Eva is also having some chocolate. I think it could be a good option for um, a classroom science tool, but just like anything else, I think that sometimes just it can be, it depends. I know if this, um, this kit was actually originally from a kid's summer camp that I did. And the original way that this was designed was not very functional in my opinion. And I think just the, the fact that the system didn't work well made it not a very good learning tool for kids. So to answer your question, it, it will probably depend. And um, I'm gonna eat some of these dark chocolate uh, uh, covered almonds, but it's gonna depend. And I think uh, especially for like a one-off lesson, a plant press might not be that great, but if you're doing something where you're having like extended lessons or you're combining the plant press with nature journaling, I think it would make uh, more sense. All right, so I think I'm going to try to cut this one into smaller pieces and then just glue a piece of it onto this page in my journal. And I also have a different type of glue that I'm gonna be trying. This is one of the ones that's supposed to be better than Mod Podge. Oh, that was the reason why I need to eat these almonds is because I'm gonna use this container this is always a good excuse for eating chocolate covered almonds is that these containers are useful for storing art supplies. Mm. Okay. Now that this container is empty. Um, now that this container is empty, we can use it for like mixing glue and stuff like that. Oh, cut what is here. Um, so one thing that I think would be really interesting to explore, and I think I've mentioned this in a previous show, is a hybrid between a nature journal and an herbarium. Like if you look at those herbarium books, it's like, this is really cool. This is amazing. Imagine if you combine that with sketches and pages that had writing on them. Oh, it looks like this is not going to want to separate over here. Shoot. This leaf is going to be ruined. Okay, here's where I use these tweezers. Tweezers are definitely helpful to have with your plant press. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't have been able to save that without the tweezers. So I like the way this one looks just straight on the um, white paper. Bonus to anyone who can identify this plant. Growing under oak trees. You might have noticed that it has, it sticks to my finger. It has lots of little hooks on it. Okay, so time to try this new glue that's supposed to be able to work as a um, sealant, sort of like Mod Podge does, but I'm not gonna seal it right away because then I won't be able to close my pages. Okay. So I'm gonna put a little bit now that these, I ate all these dark chocolate almonds, I can use this thing in a bunch of cool ways. Right now, I'm just going to put a little bit of glue on the top there. I'm using this ibuprofen thing for a water container. Probably put in way too much water. Shoot. I should be doing this on a separate surface, but I'm being lazy. There are other ways to do this. I've used that Tombow glue 
pin recently in some episodes to glue plants in, and that's probably a portable option. I wouldn't want to be doing anything that requires a water container and a, a little mixing area in the field, personally. Whoa. There we go. Hopefully that was enough glue. Ah. It's probably not enough glue, but I'll do a clear coat on that later. And this um, paint is supposed to work for that. Um, dang, Eli's eating some really big chocolate covered almonds, I guess. All right, while I have this page open, I think I'm just going to go ahead and put another um, different plant on this page. So I have some of these. Uh, oh, that's what I should talk about now is the ethics of picking plants. So there's going to be certain places in the world where you're probably not going to want to pick plants. And um, the, the main answer to the question of whether or not you should pick plants is it depends. And the idea that there's you know, certain things like that, that are always, always follow a certain rule is, is slightly absurd. So, um, I, I appreciate the, the people who are out there, um, you know, getting policing vigilante style policing, the picking of, of flowers, but there's definitely cases where it's way unwarranted and a little bit of critical thinking. And you soon realize that there's, um, there's definitely some cases where um, picking flowers is actually a really good thing. And so one thing that I did on this trip, for example, is I tried to pay attention to, is this plant really abundant? How many of them are there? And thinking about the impact and how likely are more people to come pick plants here, things like that, and try to ask those questions and think about them and make your own ethical decisions. That's what I would suggest. So this plant, for example, was super abundant and it's one of the main things that I pressed because of that abundance. There were certain flowers I didn't even pick and press at all because I didn't see very many of them. Oh, up and Adam is here. Yes, I think that is it. It has a really lame common name like Fiesta flower or something like that. And then I'm also doing this one, which can't remember if it's actually a Phasalia, but um, it definitely has that great scorpoid sign there. I'm still behind on iNaturalisting any of the wildflowers from this trip. Okay, with this one, I'm gonna try a different technique and I'm gonna try to just, I'm gonna go a little bit more crazy and I'm just gonna try to paint the um, glue over the entire thing. I've done that with the Mod Podge, but sometimes it makes it all sticky. So we're going to see if this PVA glue is really transparent. And we're also going to see if it uh, sticks really badly to the other page. Hemsinkia, that's it. Yep. I always forget that one. Oh, I saw a super cool, I saw a horned lizard on this trip and a bunch of Western toads. The horned lizard was during a class and we were practicing asking questions. So we were doing, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. And one of the kids in my class said, I wonder how the lizard and the toad had babies together and how the something about the sperm and the or the eggs or something because somehow the kid, because the name was Horny Toad, someone said Horny Toad, he thought it was an actual hybrid between um, a toad and a lizard. His dad was there too, so I wasn't, you know, so sure how much to go into uh, the birds and the bees. I generally err on the side of introducing kids to topics that... Uh, well, you know, 
certain topics. But if it's in, if it's something from nature, you know, it's like, hey, kids, let's talk about hermaphrodites. I love telling people about the all female lizard species. Okay, so you can see that that was in a lot of ways easier to put things down and get it flat. And we just have to hope that this glue actually does dry clear like it says it does. So I'm gonna go back and actually paint over this one as well. Sometimes the stiff brush is really hard for, for fine leaves. And in that case, um, putting some glue down before you try to do this can actually be useful for fine leaves or for fine petals. Lots of badgers um, or lots of badger activity where I just was near Santa Barbara teaching. And it was really fun to look at their tracks and places where they had been digging up gophers and stuff like that. Okay, great. While that's drying, we can peruse through and see what's behind door number two of the plant press. We also do have a plant here that we're gonna squeeze to death in the press because it's really important when you get these, one of the reasons to get these out that, that I've noticed is um, to make space for going out and collecting more. So having something that you do with your plants after you press them helps make the collecting and pressing more fun, I feel like. So what I'm gonna do with these is start setting them here if they still have anything. There's another one of that same, what is it? Full, fully, full, fully, fully stoma. Whoa, a chimera tree. Oh, Valerie's here. Hi, Valerie. Okay, so this plant's kind of boring, but we're going to keep going. One thing I should also show you is that you could, for example, just journal from this. You could do your drawing and your nature journaling from a pressed plant instead of a photo. And this is something I'm going to try to do more of because I always get distracted when I'm working from photos and I don't really like working from photos. It doesn't work for me. So what you could do is you could just look at something like this as your reference. Instead of the plant in the field or the plant from a photo, why not try and I actually think you're gonna learn certain things about drawing because this plant is two dimensional. This used to be a three dimensional plant. It's now almost two dimensional. So there's certain things you will be able to draw more easily. So I'm just gonna do a quick sketch of it. And pretend like I was nature journaling it in the field. So one thing you can do on this, for example, is you can measure the leaves. It's like having a, a specimen is very different from having a photo or a drawing. Supposedly in some places, I think in like medieval Europe, they would include pressed plants together with herbal medicine so that people would know what was actually in it. And because the names of plants change a lot, having that pressed specimen was a way to show anybody who knew the plant what was actually in the medicine.
All right, so I'm going to put some notes in here. There's a good there's a good one for when you have a phone with you and have access to the internet. I knew that the I knew with these I had I did these plants on previous trips, most of the ones that I picked, and I was also being pretty conservative. It also where I was was not like a state park, it was like a cattle ranch. So there's a lot of uh intense disturbance there anyways. And I only picked the things that I seem to, to see a lot of. But of course, what Mindy's pointing out is probably the good way to go. Um, and, you know, it's one of those things people will argue about. Some people are completely for, you know, hands off interaction with nature. And I think I le lean more in the other direction. I'm a little bit more worried about the human nature connection going extinct. I think. Um, that's probably the most worrisome endangered species of all. And sometimes figuring out places and ways for humans to actually regain that connection is super important. Um, I am using, guess what? I found, I found a couple of these, um, of my favorite pins available again and bought them up. And I think Eli got some for me too. So, um, one of my Patreon patrons told me of a source where there was some of these and I bought them. And then I think, um, I think that Eli also, um, got some like from Malaysia or something. I heard there's a supply in Australia somewhere too. Here's another good kind of way of thinking about this maybe. All right. So let's see. There's some really funny, if you read about the Galapagos, there's some really interesting stuff where you can read about the California Academy of Sciences going to the Galapagos and collecting some of the like last remaining uh, Galapagos tortoises. And I think they collected like 10,000 specimen animal and plant specimens while they were there. And they had this idea that they were like saving things, um, uh, for science, even though they knew that some of them might be the last species living in the wild, which seems really, or last individual seems really crazy uh, of a rationalization. But okay, so what else am I going to add on to this? Prickly leaves. I could do a joint comparison here. These ones have less, I don't see the scorpoid sign on these ones. This one definitely has a scorpioid sign. All right. So, so far, yeah, these are the ones that there was ton, tons of both of these ones growing, especially these ones uh, under the trees. And all right, let's keep going and look at some of the others. But what you can see is that it's possible to have a press plant here. And even if you don't physically incorporate it into your nature journal, you can nature journal from that. And that would be something you would be able to do from herbaria collections where they have these stored officially and you could go in there. And I actually think that's preferable to working from a photo in many ways especially for me and that's something i just i never drawn from pressed plants before so that was totally new uh, realization for me okay let's see what else we have in here here we go here's an example where i tried to show the roots as well which i think is really interesting um Let's see what Adam thinks what, or if anybody can identify any of these, that would be fun. And I think I'm going to do the thing where I nature journal from these first and then later experiment with gluing them in. 
I'll take these straps out of here too. For now. This is something I want to try in the canopy more because after my time in Panama, I realized how hard it is to nature journal in the canopy. One possibility would be to press plants. And then once you're down from the trees to nature journal them um, afterwards or do the, do like a botanical illustration afterwards. Let's see if we can get a little better angle here. So I'm noticing numerous petals, I would call it. And it looks like only one layer of sepal-like structures. Thin stem. You can also measure from these if you needed to. Composite type flowers seem like they're one of the ones that's not super easy or conducive for pressing. All right, so that would be an example of just a little nature journal entry that you could do almost like a species profile based on a um, pressed plant. So now I'm going to take another one on here and I'm actually going to glue it in. So this is a soup. These are, I think these are all in, invasive, non native species, but I love how it stands up like that too. Um, just think of all the fun compositional things you could do with a plant like this but I'm actually gonna put it in here at an angle and not really play with the composition or artistic part of it. But one thing I think is, is a really a uh, high return area is to work with um, plants that are considered weeds or considered invasive and do more artistic things with them. What if I could fit it in? And you can see there's, multiple stages of flowering and fruiting represented on this one. See, Mindy's way more um, technical and uh, legit than I am. These are just sort of, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be, I'm not actually like, it's not very scientific, any of what I'm doing. I'm not trying to be like that scientific about it, but um but yeah, I should have, you know, like ideally I would have GPS and all this stuff. Okay. Um, I'm just going to put that one in at an angle just like that. Uh, yeah, they're a rhodium. And then I think it's the gold fields or whatever. I think these are gold fields. I can't remember the, um, the Latin name. It's one of the ones that goes crazy at... Um, Carrizo Plain, which I had to drive past. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to go back there later, but it was really hard. I was really close, um, but didn't go out there. But a lot of California is blooming right now. All right, I need more glue.
Cool. All right, while that's drying, let's see what's behind door number four. Oh, Death Valley. That sounds awesome, Adam. I was thinking about maybe trying to go by there. Uh oh, what's going on here? Okay, so I'm gonna move these out of the way and see what we have next. Eat some chocolate. Okay. Look, more of those. So these are all in the geranium family, and I'm pretty sure they're all from Eurasia, but I wanted to try some different. I just love the way that they look. I mean, how cool of a plant is that? And it seemed also that there were two different types. Notice how this one has a fruiting body and that one has a fruiting body but they seem very different in size so i wonder if they're different um i wonder if they're actually different species or subspecies or if there's just variation in the conditions these would probably probably would be good to just tape down like uh mindy is mentioning all right, so anyways, these will be really fun. I can't wait to play with these in different sort of uh, settings, like on black paper maybe. So you can see there's a lot, and I think that pressing plants, just speaking of it from an artistic perspective, I think that pressing plants can really help you think about drawing better and help you think about composition on the page better. Even just how you lay in the plants on a page teaches you a lot about composition. That's one of the reasons why I'm interested in, in doing it is as um, a part of the rest of my nature journaling and learning about plants. Okay, let's see what's behind door number five. Yeah, oh my gosh. See, Mindy, this is last time I talked about press um, press plants. I think Mindy was there also and just had so many great tips. So uh, Mindy knows way more about this than I do. Oh, it looks like some mold might have started growing here because it wasn't drying fast enough. But ooh, does anyone know what this one is? And here's a great example of the colors fading. This had a lot more color in it before. That's definitely not getting picked up. Hey, Joseph, if you're just advertising your own live stream and are not engaging with the content, um, that's not very, uh, not a very uh, functional way to, to promote your content. Um, all right, so I'm really excited. I have pressed this plant before. This time what I did differently is I actually, these were very three-dimensional, so I sliced them before putting it down on the page. And a lot of these ones, I'm also removing some leaves. So we'll talk about that when we get to, to this one. Before I press it, I am going to take um, parts of it away. And I did that with this one. So actually this part of the inflorescence is actually the flip side of that. And I had to slice it in half. So this is Salvia spathacea, I think, which is called hummingbird sage, which isn't a great name because there's a lot of uh, plants with that name. And um, it's, a re it's really cool. It grows native in some parts of California. And I really like the overall sort of composition of it and the texture. So that was a cool one. And I will put that into, I, will, I might experiment with putting this into my nature journal later. It will be pretty extreme because it's, it's rather three dimensional. Okay. Let's see what's in the next one. Whoa, what is going on there? So one really interesting thing about pressed plants is it's a perfect example of how humans separate individuals from, uh, a tangled mess uh, in nature. And so I was actually at first trying to separate this vine from the plant that it was growing on so I could just 
press one of them, but then I realized I should actually press these two things together because that is actually telling the story and is representing what's happening in nature. So I believe this is a coffee berry and on the coffee berry is growing this cucumber family plant. Oh, interesting. It looks good for the coffee berry from this side, but anyways, on it is growing this, I think man root is the um, common name and it's a cucumber family plant growing on this um, coffee bush. And it's very three dimensional because this is a woody plant but it's good to kind of experiment and see what's possible. And I think pressing a woody plant at this size seems to have worked. I don't know if I would glue this into my nature journal, but I think it's, it's pretty interesting and cool. And it shows a relationship, which is always more interesting than an individual. And we come from an intellectual lineage that focuses a lot on individuals and, uh, they're usually a construct or sort of arbitrary in nature. Okay, so let's see what's behind the next door here. And while I'm doing this, I'm trying to organize my leftover sheets so that I can get everything ready to um, do another round of pressed plants. Cause I saw some really cool, I think hemi parasitic plants growing outside that I wanna press. Oh, Susan is here. Um, yes, exactly. Good point, Adam. Um, okay. So can, does anyone know what these ones are? These are really common California plants right here for certain parts of California. And they smell. That's the other cool thing about pressing plants into your nature journal is you can get that elusive other sense that is so hard to represent otherwise. This one is, I believe, um, Artemisia. People call it sagebrush, even though it's not a sage. Yeah, there you go, James. Yep. And then this one is an actual sage. Um, and I can't remember, or wait, no, this is actually the, this is actually the sticky monkey. It's the, it used to be mimulus and now it's like Dipla, Diplocus, Diplocolis, Diplosaurus. So this, even though it looks like a salvia, it's, it's actually not. And this one is not a salvia, even though it's called sage. So more confusion in the realm of plants. These really fine leaves would probably be hard to stick down but I bet this would look cool on a different colored paper. And if you want to include smell in your nature journal, something like this is a really great option. Okay. All right. So let's see what's behind the next mystery door. I've seen a couple bugs crawl out of here, like a beetle and an ant. Oh, there's a ton of dirt on this page. Ah. So I was actually going on someone else's class when I pressed this one. And so I was in a little bit of a hurry because they were moving kind of fast. And these were both growing in a riparian area. And this looks like some type of mint. I don't know what that is. And then this is this plant growing out of a riparian area. Uh, lots of dirt still. I would have cleaned that off way more and arranged the leaves better, but I was in a hurry. So there is a press bug on this page, actually. I wish my camera could zoom in better, but there is an ant right there. And this ant wasn't even associated with the plant, but got kind of squished in there later. But that is an ant right there. I have pressed bees before, too. Um, honeybees. Honeybees are imminently pressable. Ooh, and this one was one of my favorites. I'm going to give a moment for people to try to identify this one. I was very excited to find this. And I wish you could see the colors right now. Any guesses? Oh yeah, Susan, I have so many mosquitoes in my journals. 
They're really easy to. But mine aren't accidental. So I was actually teaching a class for kids and I showed the kids like, look, you can catch mosquitoes and flies uh, in your nature journal and squish them like that. And then um, like 30 minutes later, I looked over and there was a kid and he was sneaking up on this fence lizard. The fence lizard was like over here on a branch or something. And the kid's like sneaking up with his uh, notebook. And I was like, no, you can't, um, you can't do that technique on uh, lizards. They're uh, too big. And that would not be very ethical either. So unfortunately, bugs are still get to sort of, well, if their nervous system really is less developed, maybe that's a justification, but that's a slippery slope. Okay, here, here is this plant, and if no one's going to guess it, it is, um, it is a salvia, even though in some ways the inflorescence makes it look like a sage, I mean a, 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 a thistle, and this one is actually a type of chia that the Chumash Indians harvest. So the seeds of this were an important food source um, in the Santa Barbara area. And I think it grows in other parts of California as well, but there's multiple species and I can't remember exactly, but I think this one's Salvia columbaria, um, but it's a type of chia. All right, I'm gonna slide it up a little bit that way. I'm really looking forward to doing some fun pages with this one or even just drawing drawing from it. And I'm really glad that I um, collected the, the roots as well. Thanks, I'm, I'm glad that you think it's a beautiful drawing. All right, so let's see what's behind the next door. Ooh, two different types of lupin. So this is a joint comparison. And one thing I'm really excited about is that there's uh, nodes on here. So this is the nitrogen fixing nodes, I'm pretty sure, of this lupin, which was really cool to see that um, when I pulled it up. There was a ton of this one low growing, and then this is a taller one. So closely related, but not the same. Perfect chance to do a joint comparison. The human brain can notice way more when we have two things next to each other. And um, then if we uh, if I were just looking at one thing at a time. So when you have two similar plants next to each other, you can see a lot more than you would otherwise. Yeah, I had to block that kid. I don't know if that was it's probably just a kid. I think there's a lot of these kids that are that join in on lives. And then they like say, hey, come check out my channel. And then you go look at it and it's all about Minecraft. Um, and they don't get that people who are interested in nature drilling might not necessarily be interested in Minecraft. So I kind of think it's probably a real, that guy was probably a real, real kid. Um, okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna press this one because now I have some open space and I will show you some of the stuff that I've been doing and trying to get better at with when it comes down to pressing. Okay, so it's really nice to have some fine scissors and tweezers um, to do this. And to kind of think about like a lot of things, think about what your actual intention is. If your intention is collecting scientific information or sort of uh, information that could be used for science, then you definitely want to, like Mindy was mentioning, ID the plant in advance, um, uh, keep information about where you collected it, how it's growing, all of that sort of metadata and all of those things. And you're also going to, if you're collecting it for a scientific reason, you need to collect the parts that are representative for that plant. So for a lot of plants, the leaves aren't representative representative so if there's flowers you have to include them if there's like some type of fruiting body that also might be really useful but make sure that those are really visible in the plant that you're taking if you're just doing it for artistic reasons think about the composition and what the end product is going to be are you going to put it are you going to frame it are you going to um, put it in your nature journal or are you just going to use it as a reference um all of your choices that you're going to make of how you press it will be based on what your 
your goal or intention is. So I just want to use it in like a card or something artistic. So one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to remove some of these damaged leaves. Dam removing damaged leaves is a perfect example of doing something that changes the reality and the representation of nature. So be aware when you make those choices. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to remove some of these leaves that are on the backside that make it more three-dimensional. And I'm probably going to remove a lot of the stem, which is too, too thick. This leaf is really interesting because it has bird poop on it. And part of me kind of wants to press it just because of that. This one I just picked right outside. And this is a really great question, Susan. I think that it probably depends on the area. And I know that there's, you know, sometimes there's a lot of interpretation that has to go on with some of these laws. One thing you can do is when you're picking off some of these uh, leaves and flowers that don't work for you is you can think about how you might press that leaf separately and show an important part of it. Like Mindy just mentioned, these leaves that I'm removing, some of them I could be pressing right side up or upside down because those can be important things for identifying plants. There's also different like tips. So like here, there's this cool tip. Maybe I could press that in a different way. Or like on that salvia spathacea that I showed a while ago, I, I use the parts of the flower I cut off and press them in different ways. This plant has a bunch of um, aphids on it, but I think I'm probably just going to have to squish them to, together with everything else. And I'm going to also think about how these flowers are going to lay, and maybe I would separate some of them. One thing I could do is I could put them to the side. I can start thinking about composition right now, especially if I'm trying to do this, trying to think about the aesthetics of it, how it's going to fit, how it fills the page, where other things might go, because you have other elements, such as that leaf at the top. And this is where I think pressing plants can really help with your composition even if you're not trying to do something scientific. So like, let me make a decision here to get rid of that leaf. You can also kind of fake stuff too. So, and some of this could go against, and the if your intention is to try to show a representative plant, maybe doing something like that might actually be really confusing. Oh, Hashi is here, hi. Um, so I'm not going to do that because it looks weird. And then what I'm going to do is I'll probably flip some of these over to this side or pick some off. So like I can take this one off here and I think I'm going to take this one. One thing you could think about is like, Maybe you want to show a hummingbird in here or another plant that grows together with this or something like that and show that kind of relationship. I'm going to press some of this pedicularis um, in a few days and it's a partially parasitic plant. So maybe it would be cool to try to get a leaf or something from one of the host plants if I can figure out what, what that is. All right. So I kind of like the composition just like that. and maybe a title could go up there. Since this is the same format as my nature journal book, it's gonna make it really easy. Like all of this is transferable. So the this kind of layout, like if I think about this, and I, I did that in a short amount of time with a plant instead of with a drawing. If I was doing that with a drawing and a painting, it would take me way longer. But basically I just gotta experiment and it's all reversible. Look at how much learning about composition can happen when you're working this way um, that can then cross over to your drawings. Like maybe this is better, a better composition. It leaves me more room. Like if I wanted to put a bunch of text. So what I'm doing right now, and I, I probably shouldn't be giving this away, but what I'm doing right now is a, a, actually a really cool way to accelerate my learning about composition for botanical illustration. So instead of going through, even with thumbnails, I wouldn't have been able to try that many things in that short a period of time. So I think I'm just going to go ahead and leave it like that. And then I could put a title there. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to get my next, my other piece of paper. I'm going to put it on top. And if it's something that it seems like 
I had to really force it into position. I'm going to want to try to squish it right away, get some weight on it right away. I'm not going to worry about it too much in this case, but I am going to get it in between my two pieces of cardboard that help it dry out and that also um, space them out a little bit better. So I'm going to get it between my two pieces of cardboard and then I'm going to put all of my ones that are, that are already finished in there on top of it and then tighten it up. So those are all the ones. This is my working end of my press. And then this is gonna be the end that I can add, or the working end is the, this is my full end, and my other one's gonna be my empty side. So all of these extra pieces of cardboard are just gonna go on top of that. And all of my extra pieces of paper are gonna go on top of that. So I'll know where to start from next time I pick this up in my big piece of wood. And then I'm going to put these straps down. I've tried like three different ways to close my press and ended up with this, which is just these straps for, they're usually for like attaching canoes to your car or something. And then hopefully pretty soon I'm going to get to do another trip to um, somewhere with a lot of wildflowers and press a bunch more plants there. But while I'm in Sonoma County, I'm going to be pressing some of the plants around here. Um, and I think the best is actually if these buckles are on this side and then you can put your knee down on it to really crank it down. They're not ratchet straps, so you don't really get um, that much mechanical advantage but you can you can get them pretty tight all right that's that's a lot of capacity all of this is capacity for new plants and this setup i can tie this into a loose knot and sort of attach it to my belt and carry it actually with my nature journal. So the other day I, I was able to carry this into the field while also carrying my nature journaling stuff. That was a little bit of an experiment, but I think it worked. And um, I got some good nature journal pages as a result. Yes, totally. So this is why I didn't do any, I did not even do any flower pressing or anything at all like that, um, basically for the last, uh, Whole, almost whole year because I was in Galapagos and I was in the Amazon. So that's one of the reasons why I didn't do that. All right. So thanks everybody for joining in. Um, remember that you can support me by uh, signing up for my Patreon. A lot of you are Patreon members already. You get access to special stuff, but you also just get the, the honor of knowing that you're supporting this show. Um, the show is basically totally dependent on all of you. So thank you so much. And we have four parties a year, four live parties where I share my journals and I'll go through every single page. Here's the index. I'll go through every single page. I used to do this, um, in a regular YouTube show and i do share a lot of these pages anyways but what i'm starting to do is make it just for patreon members because they're the ones that actually make this possible and um otherwise it would not be possible at all all right thanks everybody for joining in um thanks kate susan up and adam jean mindy whole bunch of people joined in james was here hashi was here Ivea, whole bunch of people all right everybody bye